Matthew Bell with InsurancePrescription.com. Today I wanted to talk about some of the components, some of the factors and things that go into premium costs. So what actually affects insurance rates. In other videos we've talked about underwriting and obviously for conversation about insurance, underwriting and insurance go hand in hand. But there are other factors that go into the premium calculation and I just thought I would kind of run through three of the ones that are generally brought up. And in fact, when I say that they're generally brought up in licensing exams and other study materials, these three things literally are constitutive of what the premium calculation is. So, so life insurance in general is an agreement between an insured party and an insurer or an insurance company. And it's a contract. It's a legal contract between the two parties. And essentially, just to kind of boil it down to some of the most fundamental level, the contract consists of a promise on the part of the insured to pay a certain sum, and this is usually called the premium, to the insurance company. And in return, the insurance company agrees to pay out another sum, a different sum, and that's called the death benefit to the beneficiaries of the insured when the insured dies. Now in this video then, we're going to be taking a look at the portion that is the contractual portion that is coming from the insured party, and that is the premium. So what constitutes the premium? And there are actually three main factors. The first is going to be expense loading. The second is interest crediting. And then the third are mortality charges. So insurance companies are, after all, companies. And they do face various expenses. So one obvious expense that they will have to face, given the nature of their business, is that they will predictably have to pay out death claims. Now, there are other factors here. There are other things that may go into expenses that are normal, predictable business expenses for an insurance company. Another one that's in the vicinity would be cash surrenders. So if a person has a policy that has cash value inside of it, it's altogether possible that that person will decide to cash that policy out prior to his or her death. And in that case, the insurance company is going to have to produce the cash value, less any surrender charges or any other fees that might be contractually taken out of that cash. But at the same time, the insurance companies are going to have to have enough cash on hand or enough cash reserves in order to meet expected obligations. So cash surrenders, policy loans are another one, and of course, death claims would be the main thing that we think about when we think about an insurance company. But the company is also going to have to pay certain costs that just have to do with doing business. And these costs are not going to be specific to insurance companies, but they're going to include things like business overhead. There presumably is going to be a corporate headquarters, there's going to be salaries that have to be paid, copy machines that have to be powered, that have to have ink and paper and all the things that go along with running a company. Computer systems and networking people and, and just layers of security. There's going to be a number of factors that go into this. This is just going to be normal operating expenses. In addition to that, there are going to be costs that have to do with acquiring various different contracts to put on the books. So insurance companies are structured in this way, somewhat similar to other companies where you're going to have employees that are going to get paid to perform a job. But in many cases, insurance producers, as they're called, the people who actually go out and write the business to put insurance policies on the books, they're going to be paid commissions. And so these are acquisition costs that are going to have to be accounted for in various different premium and bookkeeping calculations. In addition to that, the insurance companies are also going to have to have some provision for emergencies. So in a similar way to how an individual would have to set up an emergency fund, companies have to set up emergency funds, or they may call them contingency funds, but they're going to have to have cash on hand or cash that's in some kind of a semi-liquid or liquid vehicle so that they can get access to it quickly in the event of some sort of emergency situation. Premiums are paid in advance. I have an entire video where I go into just the word premium, and premium probably is best understood as a payment in advance. And it's certainly the case that when you pay an insurance premium, you are paying ahead of whatever the coverage period is. This is not unique to life insurance. This is going to include property and casualty and other kinds of insurance, health insurance. So when you pay for insurance coverage, you are paying in advance of whatever coverage period is applicable. That means that the insurance company, in part, is going to be taking your premium and investing it in some kind of a vehicle. Now, there are laws on the books that prevent insurance companies from investing money in risky instruments, but presumably they're hoping to get some kind of a rate of return, and also you are hoping that they do get that rate of return, because if they do, 
then your premium costs are going to be offset somewhat by the expected return that they're going to make on money that's invested. So insurance companies invest a portion of the money that they receive in premiums, and that money is credited interest or earns some interest in some kind of a conservative vehicle. Once again, they're going to have to apportion some of the premium for their reserve. Some of the premium will be invested. There are a number of different places that the premium money goes. But the third and probably the most interesting and unique aspect of a premium calculation is going to be the one that's got specifically to do with the risk calculation. And the most direct way of putting that is, in terms of life insurance, the mortality number or the mortality component of the premium. Now, in health insurance, this is going to be called the morbidity number, but in life insurance applications, mortality, of course, having to do with death. Now, this is going to be where the underwriting is going to be relevant, but it's also going to be where it maps a person onto a certain table that gives the approximate percentage chance that any given individual is going to die given age, sex, and other characteristics. So, as I said, there are a number of laws that govern the amount of reserves the company has to keep and the kinds of investments into which the company may permissibly invest premium dollars. Let me just say a word about level premiums. So in some cases, and especially this is the case with annual renewable contracts, so for example, annual renewable term is simply term insurance, the price of which goes up every year in line with a person's age. And so when you think about the person's mortality risk, that's going to increase and their mortality cost is going to go up every year. And this is simply a function of them getting older. So if a person turns from age 50 to 51, all things being equal, let's say that they come in with the same kind of health profile, the same risk profile in terms of driving risk or in terms of credit risk, they've got the same risk profile. It's just that one person is 50, one person is 51. Let's say they're both the same sex. The idea here is that the person who's 51 has a slightly increased risk of dying simply because they're one year older. And this is simply a function of the mortality tables. But for many people, they're not interested in paying a contract that goes up like that every year. They want to lock in a certain rate. So just from a mathematical standpoint, there's a way of understanding how a level premium can be understood conceptually. So this is just a toy example. I'm going to imagine a premium schedule over five years. And this is extraordinarily abstract and toy here. So the first year's premium is a dollar. That's for the whole year. Second year's premium is two dollars. The third year is four dollars. The fourth year is eight dollars. And the fifth year's premium is sixteen dollars. So you notice that the premium doubles every year. Now once again I'm, I am making this example extraordinarily crude. This is simply to illustrate a general point about the way in which level premiums can be calculated. So if we add up all those premium costs over the five years so 1 plus 2 is 3, and 3 plus 4 is 7, and 7 plus 8 is 15, and 15 plus 16 is 31. So there's 31 total dollars expected to come in over the course of five years. Now it could be that the person simply pays one the first year, two the next, and so on. And that input of premium would match or would be tailored to increase along with their mortality. But another way of figuring out how they could pay into that policy would be to average the amount that they're going to pay in. So if we simply take the total amount, $31, and divide it by 5, we get an average of $6.20 a year. So if they pay $6.20 a year for five years, they've paid in 31 total dollars. So they've paid in the same amount as they would have paid if they had paid it differently every year according to their mortality risk. But you can notice then, in this case, that the premium exceeds the mortality cost for the first three years. In our example, $6.20 is $5.20 more than a dollar. It's more than $2. It's more than $4. So it takes until year three, complete three years of the contract before the mortality cost actually matches the premium input. But in the remaining two years, the person is putting in less than what their mortality actually dictates. But it's okay because the overcharge the amount that they paid in in excess of the mortality cost for the first three years covers the difference. So once again, my example is extraordinarily crude and it ignores numerous factors, not the least of which is the interest credit factor. But in general terms, the way in which the premium is going to be calculated is going to be based on those three factors. So mortality, interest, and expenses. Now sometimes in more complex or more industry-specific literature, you'll find two other terms. The first term is going to be gross premium, and the second will be net premium. 
So net premium is simply mortality charge minus interest. So it's a minus, it's a subtraction because the interest is going to tend to bring the total premium cost down. So the interest is working in your favor. The interest is helping you to pay the policy off is the idea. So mortality minus interest is net premium. And then gross premium is going to be net premium plus expenses. So when you add in the expense component, and again, this was for acquisition costs and overhead and the expectation of having to pay out death claims and cash surrenders. When you add in expenses, you get a total premium cost calculation. So gross premium factors everything in, mortality, interest, and expenses. I know I've kind of sailed over a number of things. There are a number of different niceties that we could dwell more in depth on. But if something I said was of use to you, I ask that you please like the video, subscribe to the channel, click the notification bell to be alerted to new content as it becomes available. I thank you so much for being with me today, and I look forward to seeing you again in another video. Thank you.